This is a production of Cornell University. I'm so happy y'all are here. Like five minutes ago before you all walked in, the room was empty. I was like, well, this will be the first. I'll get to present to an empty room. But um, anyway, it's lovely to see all of you. And those of you on Zoom, it's nice to see you too. Um, so it will, I'm not actually going to be talking to you about an experimental learning program, although we are experimenting a little bit with it, but more of an experiential learning program that's called Learning by Leading. And um, I want to Give you a little context before I jump right into what this program is and start first with um, that it, it comes from a place, a very purposeful place. Uh, at the Botanic Gardens, we uh, launched a strategic plan in 2018 and we've been working from it since then. And at that time, we also crafted a new mission, which you probably can't read this tagline here, but connecting peoples and plants for a world of beauty, diversity, and hope. And so the, the premise behind this is that we have bio, biological diversity and we have cultural diversity. And those two things are intric intricately connected and dependent on each other. And we wanna elevate that and share those different stories and how they come together. And to do that, we have these three goals that we, we focus on all the time as we're thinking about how we do things. And those goals are to grow. We do that through all the gardens that we have, through the natural areas that we have, and we wanna do that in a sustainable fashion. We have lots of programs and we wanna inspire people, whether it's through the programs or it's through those landscapes to really foster that connection between plants and people, but also to steward the next generation. And we wanna connect people. We wanna connect people to plants, but we also wanna connect with this university and the wealth of resources that are here, the intellectual resources, um, both here within our community and beyond. So those are the three ways that we think about how we do everything that we do. And the more that we can do something that hits on all of those goals, the better. So we've been working with students for a long time, since as long as I've been here. And we have um, an intern program, had an intern program that was very successful. And we dabbled with other kinds of student learning programs. But what we really wanted to do was to um, bring find something that would capture and allow us to do all of these things. And so when we were thinking about this after shortly after launching the strategic goal, I was at uh, an American Public Garden Association workshop for University Botanic Gardens. And we were talking, we were, the workshop was about how do you work with students? How do you engage with students? How do you get them to come to your programs? How do you teach with them? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And it was a really fruitful discussion. And out of that, um, met some colleagues from the University of California, Davis, and they presented this program called Learning by Leading. And it was a program that they started 15 years prior. And <clears throat> they were in a position similar to us where they were, their resources were dwindling, the university's budget model was changing, and um, they were really keen to work with students and with faculty. And so they started this program and they'd had at the point that we read this workshop, tremendous success with it. Not only in engaging with students, which was their primary goal, but in really transforming their organization and transforming the students that went through the program. And then they started talking about how they started, were transforming the university itself. And we were like, whoa, this is too good to be true. And we watched what they did and we re learned about it. They invited us out to a workshop. And so we went um, at Davis to meet with some of the students um, that I have pictures of here today and talked with them and really learned a lot about it. And we said, we can do this, we should do this. And we brought it back and over the last, um, so that was in 2018, 2019, we've, we've started crafting this and we did some pilot programming of it in 2019. And then COVID came along in 2020 when we were just about to launch it full bore. And so we just took a little step back, but um, today I'm here to share some good news about it. And before I do that, want to talk to you about how this program works, how it's a little philosophically different than some of the other programs that we've had before. And it starts with the power of place. So we are here on this tremendously beautiful campus with like right now, as everybody's aware, it's just really incredible, but it's incredible year round. And there's lots of opportunities for place-based education to make meaning, to showcase the expertise that's here, whether it's through research, whether it's through teaching, or just the kinds of experiences that students can have here. And it's a really, really great place for 
co-creation and to do things in the landscape that students have ownership of. So it's one of the, and here at the, whoops, wrong button, I'll go here to, this is the herb garden and we, we think this is a great place. Students have told us it's a great place to learn. They come all the time probably to this place. And one of the things that the, um, the landscape architect at the University of California Davis was telling us at this workshop we went to is that um, people remember two landscapes in their lifetime. One is the childhood landscape that they grew up in and the meaning that it has for them. And the second one is the place that they went to college. So this has even more meaning because of the, of the space that you all are learning, students are learning. And so we really wanted to take advantage of that and build upon that. <clears throat> so the, I took this picture on Saturday. Some of our teams had a program where they were having a plant sale and they were doing crafts and just inviting people in the community to celebrate spring. And I put this up here because I wanted to focus in on this little sign right here, which you can't read right now but there it is. And this was made by the students, the teams, and I didn't have anything to do with this event, but here is the, pro this is the whole program in a nutshell. It's creating a new generation of environmental leaders through stewardship, co-creation and sense of place. So I was really proud. I was like, oh, look at that, right up up there. They did it themselves. And so they are eating and living and breathing and modeling this program for us, um, so. Um, with this program, I would decide another tenant of it. So this power of place is really important, but the other part is, is how students learn. And so at Cornell Botanic Gardens, we occupy a lot of the place that is Cornell. So I think on campus, we manage and steward 600 acres of the university's campus. So a fully one third of the college of this campus is maintained and stewarded by Cornell Botanic Gardens. So we know that students are out there in our landscapes, whether they're there with their classes and some of the faculty we know are bringing students there. Um, we know that they use it recreationally. We're trying to encourage that. Um, but we're always looking to share, find ways to share that living laboratory with students. And the other thing that we have, in addition to occupying the space, is we have these really incredible staff with lots and lots of expertise and knowledge. And we want to share that and the way that they take the knowledge, some of which they've learned here um, and as being graduates of this program and um, of Cornell and wanted to put students in touch with them to learn from them and to move beyond a space where they're just learning the whole time, right? But they're experiencing, they're getting to do the real work and they're progressing through um, a leadership ladder, which I'll show, share with you in a minute. And so elevating leadership, as, this, as the name implies, is something that's really important. It's another key tenant of the program. And we know that students no longer just need a mastery of a single subject matter, right? You have to, they have to um, be masters of lots of things and not just the subject, but you're gonna be working in non-routine places. You have to be technical, creative, interactive. There's gonna be competition, right? And know how to work in teams, know how to lead a team. What does that mean? So we are at Cornell, there's it's a full system of lots of learning opportunities. And Cornell Botanic Gardens is a fully functioning nonprofit organization that has all the red tape that comes with an organization. It has all the headaches, all the challenges, but what we try to do with this program is turn that around and look at it and present it to students, pull back the curtain and bring them along with those headaches and that red tape and all the good stuff too, but really to, to give students an experience of working in the real world. And um, part of what this does in having this organization sponsor this program and bring students in um, behind the curtain is also to provide that safety net, right? So if something goes wrong, it's okay. In fact, we embrace that and we say, that's, this is a great learning opportunity. Why didn't this go the way we wanted it to? Or why did we have a misstep here? And, and even if somebody would call it a failure, I don't ever try not to use that word, but even in something that would maybe de be deemed a failure is to look at it as an opportunity to do it, to learn from it, what went wrong, why didn't it succeed and how do we do it again differently next time? So 
just want to share with you the framework of the model and talk a little bit about how we're using it. So there are, um, so when Davis presented this to us, they were talking about how most students in an internship program are at this first step one and step two, where they are primarily learning and participating. And they don't often get to steps three and four, where they get to lead projects or they even get to mentor other students in projects. So the, the premise of this program is to move students from steps one and two up into the steps three and four and beyond as quickly as possible. And so you'll hear me talk about here in a minute. So we have team members who come on into the program and they're usually participating and learning at steps one and two. They come in, they work with us for a few hours. They're learning some of the expert, sub, the subject matter expert um, topic, and then they're participating with us. But then we want them to move into the leadership component of the program and to do that quickly po as possible, whether it's as a leader of the team or as a leader of a project. And um, students, even if they're not in a leadership position, that way they take on a leadership role in some of the projects they work on and then mentoring others and how to do that. And then what we're slowly getting to now that we've um, gotten past the COVID pause is to be moving students into even further up the model where they are able to take on, do a deep dive into a program or an area um, and do a signature project and even um, apprentice with us either as a student worker in a paid capacity or perhaps even after they graduate and come work with us or at another um, organization in that capacity. So our teams look like this. We have a staff mentor. So we have, I mentioned all the staff expertise that we have, and we have quite a bit of it at the gardens. And so we have, um, for each mentor, they have to have a subject matter expertise. They need to be able to work with students um, and they need to have the capacity to, to be a mentor. And some of that we know some of the staff that we have and who can do this, and some of that we provide training for that. So every team has a staff mentor. Um, each team has two student, student leaders, and this is a paid student. Um, right here it says that they're paid five, for five to 10 hours a week. That's during the academic year, so the fall and the spring semester. And then um, they have to do at least one, but up to two summers with us where they work with us full time. And so they, they become the team leaders, and we, we have two so that they can balance. They can both balance their strengths, but they also balance the work and take on different parts of what it takes to lead a team. And then we can have anywhere from five to 10 to 15 team members who are students who presently are doing this in a volunteer capacity. But I just had a great conversation with Marvin last week about how we might look at this in a, a for credit capacity so that there's some incentive beyond just wanting to learn the material. So this is what a team looks like. And the things that they're doing in this team, and they're doing this through, through the work that they're doing, through the experiences that they're getting, but also through some of the um, training that we give them. So there's some focus area and content, and I'll talk about that as it relates to the teams that they're on. We bring in leadership theory and practice. So we, we draw upon that, talked about connecting with the university. We have a wealth of, um, resources here, especially in mentoring students and peer-to-peer uh, -peer counseling and leadership. And so uh, we have um, brought in students from, I think it's Student Life, and they came and they did the Clifton Strengths Finder. So as, as we are all blessed with lots of strengths, um, and there's like 30 or 40 of them that, they, that the Gallup has identified, and this model says, you know, these are the 10 that you have, you are really, really strong in bring those to the table. And then the next person, they bring their 10 to the table. And the next person, they bring them, their 10 to the table. And when you have a full suite of all of those strengths and you bring them all to the table and you play to your strengths, it makes for a really collaborative and a really dynamic team. So we did training on that. We talk a lot about collaboration. There's so much collaboration, whether it's within the organization or within on campus, within even the teams themselves. And we're always talking about communicating. How do you do it well? What happens if it doesn't go well? What if you don't communicate at all? And, and um, really trying to model that for them and, and coach them and guide them through that, as well as team building and mentoring and decision making. And the very last one on here is probably the most important one, which is co-creation. And that's an opportunity for 
students to when I was talking about pulling back the curtains and going through all the steps of work and doing it, we invite them to the table. And we, it's not that we assign them programs or projects to work on. We say, here are some parameters. You have an opportunity to do something. What do you want to do with it? So I'll give you a more concrete example, which is with our education team, we say, we have an event coming up. It's for the public. And we need you to come up with hands-on activities around at this garden. But what kind of activities you do, what kind of hands-on things you want to do, what kind of information you want to share, whatever the topic is, who's working on it, that's all for you to work out amongst yourselves. And this is, a, this is an opportunity where students can take a leadership role in saying, well, I want to do this and I'll get do the research and then I'll share it with all of you. Or somebody will get the materials or um, in that capacity. So we have three teams and... Um, I'll tell you more in depth about each one of them. We have one, it's called the Garden Ambassadors, and this is our education and outreach team. We have a sustainable landscape team, and they're working, trying to develop sustainable landscapes, both at the garden and across campus. And team we call Horticulture Enterprise, which is focused on growing plants for sale, whether it's for a plant sale or it's to sell to back to the gardens to for a garden or for a garden on campus. And the slides I'm about to show you are not mine. They were created by the students in the teams themselves. Um, we asked them to present about their teams, who they are, what they're doing for uh, an advisory council meeting that we had with our advisors. And so just don't wanna take credit for their work. So this is our first team. This is our garden ambassador team. And the, we, our staff mentor there is Kevin Moss, who's our student and public um, engagement coordinator. And he works with Jakar Zellner, who is an arts and sciences major, um, and uh, Nola Rettenmeyer. And so Nola has been with us two years, and Jakar has been with us one year, staying on for two. And we received uh, an engaged Cornell grant to launch this team to do community work in the community, work on campus. They have a team of five, and what they're doing is outreach, visitor education, informal education. They're doing a lot of it at the gardens. This is our first team, and this was the one that we were um, going to go out into the community and do lots of work, and that's when COVID hit. So um, part of the reason they're a small team and part of the reason that we shifted focus, this is one of those learning opportunities, is how do you do uh, an outreach ambassadorial team all online, right? So that was that was one of the shifts, and we, start, we were like, well, okay, I guess we really are going to learn by leading and do this. This is a real opportunity to learn. And they really did. They did a great job and they um, did a lot of programming online. They'd met online and they figured out how to do team building online and all through Zoom and um, all of the, the really interesting um, challenges that that presented. There was an opportunity in every one of them. So their first in-person event was in last August. They hosted an open house for the community and they got to figure out all aspects of it. Each team member took on a different part and led um, in developing activities. And then um, we find that students are really interested in herbs and this group was no exception, but it's ripe with lots of biological information and growing information, but also very, very rich in cultural uh, connections. So the first thing they did was develop um, a, a webinar. So this is Kevin Moss, he's the mentor and he, hosts a monthly webinar series called Burden Views. And so he invited Jakara and Nola to present a webinar and they did so on lavender and presented all the cultural stories about this and did all the research around it and cooking and recipes and all kinds of things with it. Then they developed an in-person tour based in the herb garden around all the cultural stories that exist, exist around a lot of those herbs. And then they, one of the other things they did is created this discovery station where um, you get a little more hands-on and got to scratch and sniff all the herbs and take some away with you and make potions and make sachets and all kinds of things. So it was a lot of fun. And this is where we sort of step back. Kevin as mentor shares his knowledge of how you deliver and develop educational programs and what you need to think about and shares that, but then steps back and, and just sort of guides the process. One of their other um, really successful events was in the fall. There was an orientation event that we hosted right as students were coming back and we partnered with Dawn and the Nature RX program. 
and invited lots, um, as many uh, environmental nature-based organizations on campus that were interested in partnering with us, and there were quite a few, and we invited them to come down to this open house event that we had on a Wednesday morning, and they had a great turnout. Lots and lots of students came down, many came with their parents, some came just by themselves. There were, um, they set up all the tents, they figured out how many they needed, how many tables, coordinated with all those different groups to come down. Uh, we had the Raptor group there, uh, an orienteering group, and the um, group, the hiking club was there and selling their used material and telling students where they could come and get more. And we had that competition we talked about. So one of our teams is a horticulture enterprise team starting up wanting to do plant sales, but we also have another group called Hortus Forum that does the same thing. And what we're trying to do with that is to, to present different options. So, but also, well, what do you do when you have two clubs that are trying to do the same thing? And so looking at pricing and looking at having variety and what the selection is and really partnering more and more. So that's something that's a goal that the team has had for a long time. Um, is to figure that out. And then they had um, a, gar a gratitude project where they invite visitors to come into, this is a willow hut that was created by the Art of Horticulture, and we invite visitors to come in and say what they're grateful for about plants and nature and gardens, and to leave a, um, a nice little tag there, and it's kind of the, an ephemeral art project. So it's just growing again, and these tags are down there. This is in the the Pounder Vegetable Garden, which is across from the Welcome Center, Nevin Welcome Center. So we invite you all to come down, and all of you. Um, and they also have this garden stories where they interview different people associated with the gardens or different people and what their connection with plants is and gardens and tell their story through a, a blog entry. So this is another student who's not one of our co-leaders, but one of our team members. And this was um, a project that she's taking leadership on. And then they started off, they learned the importance of social media. And if you're going to have events, you need to get people to them. So what's the best way to do that? And we know from experience that Instagram is probably one of the best ways to reach students and even locals in our community. And so they went, worked with our communications team on what do you need to do to create an Instagram account and how do you make it successful and what kinds of posts you put on there and how frequent and all of those great questions. So our other team is our sustainable landscape team. This is um, led by students Daniel Sossover in environment and sustainability sciences and Coco Dawkins, who's also an environment and sustainability major. And they're mentored by Christy Boyce, who's our uh, natural areas gardener and very knowledgeable in natural areas restoration, native plant ecology. And she's been working very closely with them. They have a pretty robust team, so up to nine students. 10 students, I think, working with them. Um, they've come out often on the weekends to do restoration and natural area, um, naturalistic gardening projects. And their goals, and I don't mean to read all of this, a lot of words there, but really working with the staff, the horticulture and the natural area staff at our gardens to learn about what is a sustainable landscape? What role do native plants play in that? How do we help the gardens and the university work toward its sustainability goals through a landscape? and doing that primarily through native plant and naturalistic gardening, as well as habitat horticulture. So there are, when they first come on, they have to do a lot of learning, primarily plant identification, right? So what's a native plant? What's a non-native plant? What's an invasive? What's the difference between all those three things? Um, what's the importance, ecological importance of a native plant in a sustainable landscape? And What's, why do we care about invasive species, invasive plants or invasive pests and what role do they have? And so Daniel created this slide and he was talking about it with our advisory council because once he got trained in all this plant identification, his job was to teach the team members as they came on in all the plant identification and all of these important parts. And so then they get out and they use all that knowledge and they, this is one of the areas they did a restoration of. Um, this was a, a beautiful overlook in the Mindy Wildflower Garden overlooking Fall Creek, which would be phenomenal today. So it'd be nice and cool and shady, um, but it was overgrown with lots of invasives. So they learned you know, how you re remove those. And then now they're replanting it with natives that are low growing and don't need a lot of, especially this time of year when it's very dry, a lot of water. They do a lot of plant collecting, primarily seed collecting, and learn how do you collect seeds, what time of year, how do you clean them. So this is the progression from collecting to cleaning them to looking at them 
They look at all of them under a microscope to make sure they're viable and they don't have any hitchhikers along the way. And then they grow all of those seeds out and they learn how to grow them from seed as well as propagate other native plants that they then grow out in our nursery facility and then take to um, put out into the ground for a planting like this where they're trying to remove some of this non-native lawn and uh, create a more naturalistic sustainable landscape there. And then one project they're particularly excited about is um, their, this is a, sh a shrub restoration area. So I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the loss of all the ash trees in our community due to the emerald ash borer. And so this is a space where we had to take down close to 20 trees. So the tree canopy has completely changed um, in this landscape. So, and with that comes the threat of invasive species coming in. So they are now replanting it with um, native shrubs, both to talk about the importance of repopulating it with natives, but also to put as a demonstration of what, what native shrubs work really well in this area and can support wildlife and pollinators here. Then our final team is our horticulture enterprise team. And this is Vincent Caplioni. She's graduating from plant science this semester and Hilary Mulford, who is a landscape architecture major. And their um, mentor is Missy Bidwell, who's our greenhouse manager and very skilled and expert in plant scheduling. She's been doing it for the gardens for years to make sure that we get all the plants that we need growing and to go out into the gardens so that they uh, get planted after our last frost date. They too have a very robust team of um, looks like about 10 or 11 students who come out and regularly work in the greenhouse with them to do things like plant propagation, plant scheduling. They're learning about integrated pest management, plant health care. Um, they're learning about how to schedule those plants, what plants they have to get in at what level to get to a plant sale, and then how to see that full cycle through. So whether the plants are going into our collections or they're going out for sale, how do you make sure that they get through that whole, whole schedule? So they too um, spent a lot of time learning in our nursery and in our greenhouse. Like how do those systems work? How do they, um, what, what is required in them? And, and some of them have started from not knowing anything. They've come not from plant science, but from further, uh, majors further afield. And so it's all very new. So learning how to work in that environment is very important. Um, this is a picture of their first, and I wanna say plant sale. And I am doing this purposely because one of the things that we thought was a failure on our staff part was we had we're like had this great idea to have an enterprise team, but what we failed to do was to get them a means by which they could enterprise. That is, we didn't have a, an operating credit card sale system for them when the team started. And so we were hemming and hawing and feeling really bad about that. And then we said, we embrace the model, right? Pull back the curtain and you come with us through the red tape and through all the processes with the Cornell's Business Center to learn what it takes to get a credit card system going and what all of the steps you have to take to keep it safe and take all the training to be compliant in those systems. And they went through it from start to finish and now they have it and they were really successful. At that last plant sale, they did it by donations and they actually I think earned $700 just by offering it as donations. So that was, they felt really happy about that but they also recognized, you know, they learned things like, what do you need to be able to take in even donations and how the, process that. Um, their first sale was what they called the big red plant sale and they wanted to buy and produce mums, red and white mums, to be ready for our homecoming weekend and so they ordered those little plugs and then they grew them out and they had them for sale and figured out how to do all that, and get it timed just right and how they worked their credit card system now that it was in place and how many people they needed where and when and how to bring all this out there. And then the other type of program that they are working with is um, some of the partnerships we have with the uh, faculty and residents, whether it's on North Campus or West Campus. And this one happened to be on North Campus. And we were invited by a faculty and residents there to participate in a wellness program. And um, we, they came up with this succulent plant, talked about the importance of plants as, as a wellness and having one in your room is really important if you can't get outside or just looking at it. So they did a um, plant propagation work, uh, work <clears throat> workshop at, in the dorms and um, you know they had planned for 50 and we encouraged them to think, you know, you, you have 50 signed up, but you probably have more come in. So they, they heated our 
advice and it's a good thing because they had 150 come through that they counted. So um, they started just propagating little, just, you know, with plants, you can take one little, um, one little leaf in, in this way. And one of the things that um, I heard them talk about just recently to our advisory council is one of the things they learned pretty quickly on is you don't, can't just learn about the plants that you're selling. You have to be prepared to talk about, especially with house plants, every kind of house plants, because in this environment, they had students bringing their plants down to them saying, what's wrong with this? It won't grow. So, um, and then asking them a whole suite of other questions. So it was a great, not sure we could have prepared them for that. So that was great. So our future plans and, um, we have lots of them. We still have three teams. We're going to stick with the three teams for the foreseeable future, but we have lots of other teams that, you know, uh, basically um, mirror the parts of our organization. So our fundraising fundraiser would love to have a team, and we know students are interested in learning how to fundraise um, if they're going to go into a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have other horticulture teams that we'd like to have, design teams, other education programs, working with our youth programs and all of that. So that's, we see that on the horizon is coming. We're going to get another year under our belt with this, um, with these teams and do some more. One of the other things that we're really paying attention to is what students need from the program. In addition to the things that I've talked about, um, one is uh, course credit. So looking at opportunities for that. And the other thing is collaborations outside of our organization. So as much expertise as we have, we want to build on the expertise that's here on campus and um, do some collaborations. And I just want to share two quick ones with you. And the first of those is a partnership that we have with the university's landscape architecture, this architect. This is David Cutter here in the, um, he's the university's landscape architect. And he was approached by, we were both approached by uh, alumni affairs and development to create a medicinal garden in front of Cornell Health mm -hmm. and um, so we both thought there were there's ways that we could collaborate on bringing this to fruition and this picture is um, of the spreadsheet is one that Daniel Sosfer on our sustainable team put together of all the plants that are native and are, have sustainable features and then what their growing requirements are but also what their medicinal qualities are. And then because he's working at our organization, what all the cultural connections are. So it was, it's a really tremendous resource that we will use for a lot longer than this project. And then in the red and orange tan shirt, there is Hillary, who I mentioned is a landscape architect. So David is a tremendous collaborator with us and he invited all of our students on and has given her the opportunity to use her skills in landscape architecture and design the project with him. And she said to him, I would not have gotten this opportunity in any other way. So here is their plan. So in the top um, of the screen is their sketch scoping out, you know, what the garden is. There's their list of plants that they're going to put in, how they're going to put them together. And then this is Hillary's rendering of what the space is um, we hope will look like maybe not right after planting, but within a year or two afterwards. So, um, and that's uh, scheduled to go in uh, next month. And the enterprise team and the sustainable landscape team, they're growing up many of the plants that are gonna go into these gardens. So that's, they're getting experience there. The other um, project that our teams have taken on and it's really important to them is they wanna connect and honor all of the students on campus and they want to put to out a planting um, that says Black Lives Matter on the front of our lawn in front of the Nevin Welcome Center. And they wanted to figure out how to do this. And they approached us with the idea. And, you know, we talked a lot about how, whether we should, it should be planted in the ground or it needed to be some other kind of media. And what they landed on was a, a planting that was similar to one that a student, Justin Conrad, did years ago where he put bulbs in all of these pots and um, figured out how many bulbs that were needed, how many pots were needed, how big of a space is needed, where do we get this material, what is it going to cost, and working with Bill Miller on trying to source that, the daffodils for this project. Um, he's also offered green, um, cooler space to be able to cool them um, after we purchase them. The other part of this that their teams are taking on and working with the some of the campus groups that we worked with a year ago when we brought Carolyn Finney here to talk about her book, Black Faces, White Spaces. 
um, the Do Better Cornell, Black Students United, and some of the other uh, campus groups and community groups where to offer this invitation to participate, to have the bulbs after the planting is done and it's bloomed. And this is the rendering that they have, what it's planned to look like. This would be next spring. Um, they also, we also just had a chance to write a grant to get, hopefully get funds to support this. So they were able to see that process go through. And so I'll end with a, just a note about our impact, so what we see is happening, what we hope is happening. And I can tie it back to what I've asked students to give me in a formal way in terms of a reflection, but also what I've heard them say to others about the program is that it is doing that grow, right? That, that goal that we have of growing and providing experiential learning, both in our landscapes, about our landscapes, but also them personally um, with those real world experiences. It's inspiring, it's inspiring them in terms of what projects they wanna bring in and do for us, inspiring us. Part of what we love about this program is you all are teaching and giving them new knowledge and they get to bring that back to us and we get to learn from them. So it is a two-way street that's really inspiring for us, but it's, and as that knowledge sharing is happening, it's, um, it's very contagious. That co-creation is part of that inspirational piece of this. And then the connection, these collaborations that we're trying to have, whether it's other parts of campus or it's in our community or it's out into the world, um, that's really important to us to grow for that. And so I'll leave you with these beautiful faces and um, hope that I've shared with you a program that um, what I want to leave you with is an invitation to think about if there's a connection for you with this program with us. We're looking for collaborators, we're looking for partners. Or whether it's to connect us with the students who may be interested in this or to offer opportunities for the teams themselves. And with that, just ask you if you have any questions or comments or suggestions. Yes. I'm intrigued with the medicinal plants in front of the house out there. So it's one thing to have them there and look at them and say, this is used for that. Or, but is there any plan to let me actually use them or encourage some use or is it going to be strictly hands off because as you know there's a problem then with uh, self-medicating self-medicating <laughs> dosage and things like that so right that's why i'm intrigued by thinking this through mm, okay <laughs> well, you and I have talked a little bit offline just about the name of the garden, but um, it, it's it, the, the class was really keen on this as plants as medicine and knowing how um, how important they've been for millennia for people. So um, we do have plans to interpret the garden and talk about their uses and in medicinal way. I don't believe there will be any prescription as part of it, but just to say that this plant, you know, being around this plant, smelling this plant, this this type of thing. And it may, what we do in the herb garden is we, we say how it's been used, but we don't say how to use it. Because, you know, there's a fine, like with a lot of these plants, it's a fine line between with dosage and dosage is so important. So um, part of that uh, database that Daniel came up with is, is, you know, if any of those have any dosage, like if they straddle that line of like, if you take this and there's too many, like then we have a problem. So we talked a lot with Cornell Health about this and the, and the name of the garden as, and the class, but in the end, they, they really liked the medicinal garden title. And this is being sponsored by the class of 1971, I should mention. So yeah, so that interpretation is, that's part, it'll come in, the garden will be installed, but the interpretation will follow. I don't know if anyone online has questions. Do they unmute and ask? This is sort of a, a friendly suggestion on your ladder. Mm -hmm. I've often seen sort of ladders similar to that, but what yours didn't have that a lot of them have, and that's is step one is building trust and safety mm -hmm. uh, and sort of that relationship where people can be a little bit vulnerable and risky. Mm -hmm. So as a first step, as opposed to jumping right in, to learning and doing and things like that. So maybe just think about, and maybe that was borrowed from them. It was borrowed from them, but I, I've seen that um, in a lot of the leadership training that I've had and gone through. And part of the way I, I see that we do that is as they are all participants and, and part of the 
the team building that's happening once they're all together is to do things that aren't just about project focused. I mean, some of it is just about having fun together and building community together. And that in that community building, you're starting to develop that sense of trust so that if you, if the, the student leaders in the program have to say, you know, have a difficult conversation with someone, there is some rapport there already and there's a safe space to have that kind of conversation. Um, and and we, we had to have one over the course of the semester, you know, so it's not uncommon even at this early stage. Um, and I think that part of the way we had done enough team building and, and fun, collaborative, trying to build space for that, that it, it was, um, it actually was a really good conversation and, and helped move everybody in the right direction. Yeah, I'm sure you do it. It's just, but, it you, but putting it into out. the model? No, I think that's great. And it's the foundation for everything else you do. I like that. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks. Yeah, I invite you all to come down and enjoy. Everything is in bloom. So um, I know you get to see it on campus, but it's a little different down the hill. So come on down. Oh, yes. Sorry, I do have one question. Yes. I just heard that um, there are jumping worms in the but some of the beds. And so I wondered how your teams are working to like mitigate that and or make sure that in the plants that they sell, um, that you know, that those aren't contaminated. No, that's a great question. We, we do have that problem. <sighs> um, so for a lot of the plant material that they, they purchase and then they grow up, that's fresh media that they're being, that they're used. And so when they go out, it's not even, hasn't been touched. But, one of the projects that I didn't share that they're working on over the summer is they're dividing a lot of our daylilies. So we, and they're gonna have in June or July, I think it's July, if you're here and you're interested in daylilies, they've divided almost all of the ones that are in our collection and we'll be having a daylily sale. As part of that, to address the problem that you're talking about and any other pests that might come along as hitchhikers on that is they're cleaning all the roots off and then they, they use fresh material to put that in. So that's one of the ways that they do it. Um, and I think that they do that with anything that will come out of our collections, like out of the soil in general. So, but it's a good question. I'll follow up and make sure and ask. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everybody. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.